Second half of March 1942. Until now, the only extermination camp in use by the Nazis is the Kremlo camp. In March 1942, the gates close behind the first train loads of families destined to die in the gas chambers of two new camps. This is War Against Humanity, a sub-series of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olson. In the second half of February 1942, we saw how US President Roosevelt issued Executive Order 9066, effectively authorizing the forced incarceration of ethnic Japanese Americans in concentration camps for the war's duration. Italy, too, established new repressive facilities last month. And the Gonars concentration camps, Slovenians and Baltic peoples alike, are locked up under dire circumstances. Often to cleanse an area of its ethnic population and replace them with Italians. On the 1st of March 1942, Italian General Mario Raotta issues the Circular 3C, a manifesto for repression in the Yugoslav territories. Rauta was made commander of the Italian Second Army back in January, giving him control over the Balkans' Italian occupation zones. The memo is meant to inject the Italian troops with a conqueror's mentality, mimicking Mussolini's views on Italian imperialism infused with a harsh, supremacist mentality. It's issued in the middle of the ethnic cleansing campaign that Rauta is pursuing in Slovenia, in particular in Ljubljana. It's not based in an ethnic claim of inheritance for the Italians, but on the idea of expansion of the spazio vitale. It's similar to Hitler's idea that more Lebensraum, more territory, is needed for the dominant race to flourish. Countless Slovenians are shipped off to concentration camps or held locally to serve as hostages. Their properties are seized and given to Italian families. Later this spring, Mussolini will say about Slovenians that the best situation is when the enemy is dead, so we must take numerous hostages and shoot them whenever necessary. Until now, hostage-taking and reprisal mass murder for guerrilla or resistance activities has been the main atrocities committed by the occupying powers. Illegal and immoral by themselves, they also have the risk of taking on a course of their own and running out of control as the bloodthirst takes hold. That is exactly what happened back in January in the Hungarian zone of occupation between the Danube and the Titsa River in northeastern Yugoslavia. It starts with a raid on assumed partisans in early January, but proceeds with some bizarre actions such as dressing Hungarian soldiers as if wounded in public displays of false flag partisan activities to justify the actions. Holocaust researcher Mark Levine points to that the raid may well have been intended as a dread signal from Budapest that Hungarian rule over non-Hungarians in the Balkans would be every bit as brutal as that of other occupying powers or, for that matter, as it had previously been in Hungarian-occupied Serbia during the Great War. More recent records from the Hungarian government shows that Levine is correct. The raids are orchestrated to coincide with similar actions ordered by German Reichsminister for Foreign Affairs Joachim von Ribbentrop in the German zone and the puppet state of Croatia. Like these acts that we covered in January already, the Hungarian operation gradually turns into a bloodbath. Civilians are randomly rounded up all over the southern part of the region. Some are shot immediately, others sent off to camps. The lowest point comes on January 20th, when the raids begin in the city of Novi Sad. Here, civilians are rounded up and, if found suspicious, taken down to the Danube and shot. On several occasions, groups are forced out onto the frozen river, and then the ice around them is shelled with light artillery pieces, shattering the ice and sending the victims into their river and their death by drowning and hypothermia. When the snow settles, 1,965 men, 927 women, 477 children, and 440 elderly will have been murdered. More than half are ethnic Serbians and a quarter are Jewish. By now in March, the actions are not altogether over, but word has reached Hungary through the press and private communication from soldiers in the area. 
there is growing outrage at the reported horrors. The government now reacts by calling their raids off, although isolated incidents of random reprisal murder will continue until at least the end of April. Any such reaction in Germany is either absent or impossible under the Nazis' strict control of the press and public display of opinion. And as the spring approaches, the German Nazi killing machine is once more gearing up. Now that the snow is starting to melt, as the death camps decided on in December and January are not yet fully operational, the Holocaust by bullets begins again. On the 15th and 26th of March, roughly 5,000 German Jews deported and locked up in the Riga ghetto and the Jungfernhof concentration camp are told that they will be resettled into a town called Dunamünde. The selection consists mainly of elderly, unfit for life or work in the ghettos or parents with young children. They are loaded on trucks and are driven out of the city, but Dunamünde is not where they're going. In fact, such a city doesn't even exist. Instead, they are driven to the Bikerniki forest, where prepared mass graves await them. All of them are shot and killed. Much further east, it is the other major Axis power, Japan, that continues to gear up their activities killing civilians. In the early hours of March 3, 1942, ten Japanese airplanes depart from their newly established base on Timor and head to Australia. Their target is the small port of Broome on the northwestern side of the island. For about an hour, nine Zero fighter planes strafed the harbor, destroying 22 Allied aircraft, mostly flying boats. The port is a refueling point that is mainly used for flying boats transporting refugees and wounded. On this day, some 1,350 wounded soldiers and Dutch refugees are aboard the planes and in the harbor buildings. In total, 88 civilians and military personnel lose their lives in the attack. And as the Japanese advance across all fronts, they drag a trail of blood behind them. In Malaya, roughly 7,000 local civilians have already lost their lives to Japanese aggression during the military campaign. Now in control of the Malay Peninsula and Singapore, the Japanese set out to take care of their perceived ethnic enemies. Between February 18th and March 4th, Japanese imperial forces systematically begin to decimate Singapore's Chinese community by suk ching, or purification by elimination. Masayuki Uishi, commander of No. 2 Field Kenpetai, the military police, has divided the city into sectors. His 200 Kenpetai and roughly 1,000 auxiliary men are tasked with combing through each sector and detaining and killing anyone they find to be suspicious. It's left up to the men on the field to freely interpret what suspicious means. How liberal that interpretation can be is shown in an example in the Yi Lang Lang settlement, where the Kenpetai and their henchmen play a game of catch by throwing babies into the air, attempting to pierce them with their bayonets and swords. Sources differ but the Japanese Suk Ching massacres claimed the lives of up to at least 40,000, perhaps even 70,000 men, women, children, and babies. In Burma too, the Japanese are mostly in control now. The bombing of Rangoon in December already claimed roughly 2,500 lives. Many more lost their lives in the military campaign in January. As Rangoon starts to fall in March 1942, many thousands belonging to Indian communities flee the city. They depart on a long and treacherous march back to India, a journey which an estimated 30,000, by some estimates 100,000 Indians, will not survive. As these civilians flee or are murdered, the Japanese are already preparing the destiny of many of the ones that stay behind slave labor for the Japanese war effort, something their allies, the Germans, know all about. On March 1, 1942, Hermann Göring officially appoints Albert Speer as general plenipotentiary for armament tasks, replacing Fritz Todt. As Indy mentioned earlier in February, Todt died in a plane crash. Todt led Organisations Todt, a conscripted and forced labor army instrumental in constructing infrastructure like the German Autobahn networks in the early 1930s. 
A little side note here. The idea that Hitler was the inventor of the Autobahn, that he paved Germany, and that this lifted millions from poverty may be one of World War II's most stubborn myths. In reality, the Autobahn networks began construction in the late 1920s, and before they took power, the Nazis branded it as a Jewish capitalist novelty. But true to their opportunistic nature, in 1933 they appropriated it as a propaganda project. The projected thousands of kilometers of paved multi-lane highways will never be finished by the Nazis, though. Only half of the planned roads were laid down. Tod never employed millions of Germans in some collective wonder force. They were 120,000, many of whom were conscripted and badly paid, and now their priorities lay elsewhere. As the war draws closer, Organisation Tod is increasingly involved with the construction of military defenses, such as the Westwall, bordering France. From 1940 onwards, they start building the Atlantic Wall. Now, Organisation Tod is relevant in our series because of the structural use of forced laborers. Well over a million Germans were conscripted when the war began. After the occupation of most of Europe in 1940 and 1941, guest workers are imported, a euphemism for foreign forced laborers. Thousands more POWs and concentration camp inmates are forced to work on these projects as well, often under dire circumstances and sometimes with the sole purpose of extermination through labor. Under Speer, the use of forced labor will continue to increase and the circumstances of their work will only worsen. It will also be Speer's organization that is charged with the construction of the facilities for the German detention and murder factories. For now, the camps have mainly been built by the slave labor forces of the SS themselves. And in Auschwitz, a second camp is now completed. Auschwitz II or Auschwitz-Birkenau. It was conceived as a POW camp to handle the excess of Soviet prisoners to relieve the Wehrmacht of them. The first prisoners are 945 Soviet POWs. Almost all will be dead within three months. Birkenau is also equipped with gas chambers. We have covered how Auschwitz commander Rudolf Höss has been experimenting with Cyclone B gassing. After the plan cemented at Wannsee in January, Auschwitz-Birkenau will be transformed into a hybrid labor concentration and extermination camp. Within a month, the first transports of Jews arrive. Most of the first arrivals will be assigned to labor details of which the purpose is to work till death follows. Many future transports will take the victims directly to the gas chambers, as will be the case at the Sobibor extermination camp that also begins operation on March 1st. The Belshets extermination camp will only be finished in a few weeks, but small groups of 100 to 250 Jews are already arriving at Belshets. They are used in experiments to measure gas chamber capacity or to test the extermination process and disposal techniques. Around this time, Endlösung designer and chief of security police Reinhard Heydrich tells Adolf Eichmann in charge of logistics that the Führer has now ordered the physical extermination of the Jews. Eichmann is ordered to travel to Bevchec, where Camp Commandant Christian Wirt shows him around. Eichmann reports, I expressed astonishment that the small house, completely secluded, was built, and he told me, here, the Jews are being gassed now. The Holocaust by gas has begun. Never forget. Thank you.